Let's bow in prayer, shall we, and we'll call on the Lord together. Blessed Father, as we grapple together tonight with these two rich themes from your revealed truth to us, we pray again for the special presence of the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and guide. We're conscious that in particular this whole subject of repentance is one that's often overlooked in the church today. And our prayer would be that you would lead us and guide us more deeply into an understanding of this rich truth. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Isabel, how are you? Getting along pretty good. Dude. You're getting along pretty good. That's wonderful. Lovely. Well, tonight we look at chapters 14 and 15 of the Confession, Saving Faith and repentance. might be helpful as we begin again tonight just to once more set these two chapters in the larger context of what we're doing. Remember this part of our study really belongs to what theologians call anyway the application of redemption. The accomplishment of redemption relates to Jesus' life and his work. That fair enough? His cross work as people call it, is the foundation of redemption. This section, in terms of how Jesus' death becomes applied to the lives of God's elect people, is called the application of redemption. That's the general term that's being used or is used by theologians. And last week, you remember, I stressed the value and the importance of seeing these various aspects of redemption as all part of one. What God is concerned to do is to bring wayward, rebel, corrupted, dead sinners back into that living union of fellowship with himself. His desire is to make them like his son, who is the firstborn of many brethren, to restore the lost image of God in mankind and to re-establish a proper legal relationship. Remember that? All those things are dimensions in the restoration of sinners to himself. Now, last week again, as we recap some of this, we noted that the process of effectual calling or the act of God calling sinners back to himself is really the first work in the application of redemption. Jesus dies, Jesus rises again, God fully accepts his atoning work. How now is that connected with the elect? And it really does begin with God calling those whom he has chosen into a living relationship with his son and himself, into the relationship of faith, and uh, we've also noticed that as people come into union with the Lord Jesus Christ through faith, they are, now what's the term that relates to their legal standing? They are, no, well, if the first side of, of the legal standing is they are not adopted but justified. Justification has relationship to their judicial legal relationship. And God declares that they are free from accusation, condemnation, and guilt. Adoption relates to the personal dimension of that relationship between a justified sinner and God, whereby God receives sinners into his family, into his household, puts his name upon them, and grants to them all the rights of sonship and of family. So those are rich, rich benefits. And we noted also last week that not only is God's purpose to deal with the guilt problem of sinners, not only is it his purpose to bring them into a relationship of family, but it's also his purpose to do what else? To sanctify them, which relates to what, Isabel? To, what do we mean by that? Sanctifying means to make holy. Make holy or to purify people. So these things are part of this wonderful, wonderful work of God in restoring people to himself. Now, 
when we come to this section that looks at saving faith and repentance, it might in fact have been put earlier. It could well have come immediately after effectual calling because as God does call people, he draws and calls them to the Lord Jesus Christ to embrace him in faith. Uh, repentance is also involved in that. However, the confession puts them after effectual calling, justification, adoption, and sanctification. But essentially, saving faith and repentance are two very, very fundamental graces that are involved in bringing sinners back into a true relationship with God. And that will become clearer tonight as we go through these things. Let's then begin by having a look at what we've got here. Saving faith. And I've entitled the first of the sections, The Source and Means of Faith. You'll see that after this we go on and look at the nature and activity of faith. And then lastly, we'll look at the degrees of faith. But to begin with, we look at the issue of where does faith come from? And the confession of faith puts it this way. The grace of faith. And right at the very outset, it's wanting to stress for us that saving faith or true faith in God, true belief in God is a grace. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit working. It is an evangelical grace. It is that which belongs to the gospel. It is that which is also purchased by Christ in his redemption for his elect. So it is a grace, the grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts. It is produced by the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily accomplished by the ministry of the Word. Now, I wonder if we can just turn, I know that some of you have heard me talking quite a lot about John 6, but let's turn back to that again, because I think that this little passage illustrates to us and highlights to us many things, again, that are pertinent to the heart issue of faith. The Lord Jesus came to his own, John tells us, but his own, what? Received him not. Do you think that God gave ample testimony to the fact that Jesus was the Christ? Were there evidences and witnesses that he was the Christ? Yes. The works that he performed above everything were witness that God had sent him. Yet, we're going to put ourselves in the situation where Jesus comes and lives amongst men. He comes as light into the world, and yet the world doesn't understand, doesn't recognize, and certainly doesn't receive him. And that's a reflection of what unbelief is. Do you think that those Israelites actually saw visually with their eyes a person? Of course they did. Did they see the miracles wrought? Yes, they did. And those things can belong to simple mental comprehension, but they're not faith. They're not saving faith. And uh, in the sixth chapter of John, as we considered at chapel this morning, and uh, again on Sunday night, I alluded to this when I was speaking here briefly as well. Recall that Jesus had fed the 5,000. He had urged the people that had followed him and sought him out to seek the bread that endures unto eternal life. And then they, of course, ask him, verse 34, Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. So they want Jesus to give them the bread that's going to endure to eternal life, so they won't die. Now Jesus said to them, he declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, I want you just to note, because we'll come back to this later, 
that Jesus can refer to belief also, and the parallelism he uses here as what? What's the other term? He says, he who believes in me, but he who also what? Come. Comes to me. Indicating that the faith that he has in mind here is an active faith. It's a faith that actually appropriates, comes to him. Later on, he's going to speak of that same faith as eating and drinking. It is not a dead faith. It's not a passive faith. It's not a faith that simply gives mental assent. It is a faith that actually acts and appropriates and embraces. Now, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. In verse 36, he says, But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Now, that's important. These people had observed, they had witnessed, they had seen his miracles, they had heard him teaching, but in spite of having all the evidence before them, they did not believe. But then the Lord goes on and he says this, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And then he goes on to say that the will of him who sent him is to raise them up on the last day. Now, what's Jesus saying there? Come on, you come, you feedback, you interact a little bit with me now. He's saying, he is the bread of life. Whoever comes to him and believes in him shall never hunger and shall never thirst. You've seen me, he says, but what? You, you don't believe. However, he says, who will come? Those the, Father Those the Father has given him will come. Now, a little bit further on, verse 41. At this the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. It doesn't make any sense to them, because they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? So you see, that they're struggling with this. How can you say he's the bread from heaven when they think they know his appearance? All right, Jesus answers. Stop grumbling, verse 43, among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, that's pretty important, isn't it? He has, in a sense, been challenging them and rebuking them for not coming to him. But now he says... No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Now, that's a critical thing. You see, what Jesus is affirming and saying here is that only those the Father draw, gives to him will come to him, no one can come to him unless the Father draws them. And he says, don't the prophets say they will be all taught by God? Now, in those words, Jesus is, do you think he's surprised that people are not believing in him? No, I don't think he's not, he's, he's not surprised. Do you think he genuinely wants them to believe in him? Yes, I think without a doubt. He generally wants them to believe in him, but he's not surprised, he's not frustrated, because he knows also that no one is going to come to him unless the Father draws him. Now, that is the kind of idea and truth that the confession of faith is affirming over here when it talks about the grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls. If I can pause again for a moment, theologians have oftentimes spoken of about three or four different kinds of faith. They talk about historical faith. They talk about temporary faith. The historical faith is the faith the Pharisees would have had. They would have understood the law teaching this concerning Moses. They would have believed in the Exodus event. That is Mere assent and understanding to historical fact. Do you think unbelievers can have that kind of faith? Historical faith? Do you think that there are many, many people today who believe 
that Jesus came and lived and died? Of course there are. So there is an historical faith, which many, many people have. Another is temporary faith. And people often allude to the parable of the sower, where the word of God is sown, people receive it with joy for a time, but then when either persecution or the worldly influence of desires, etc., choke that out, and it leaves temporary faith. Then, what's the third thing? Miraculous faith. That is the power to actually believe, <coughs> to see miracles, which is viewed again as being a temporary or a special kind of thing. And then there is saving faith, which the theologians describe as the faith that enables us not simply to believe there's a God, not simply to believe that there have been historical events that we can acknowledge, but the faith that enables us to come to Christ and embrace Him, believe in Him, receive in Him, rely on Him, trust in Him for our salvation. And that is recognized as being a grace that the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and is ordinarily accomplished by the ministry of the Word. Okay, any comments on that? There are other passages that relate to this. But any questions or comments first? Okay. Can anybody think of another instance where it's very clear that God is involved in enabling somebody to believe? Can you think of another passage in the Scriptures? Acts 16 is one, where Paul is at Philippi. Does that ring a bell, jogging minds? At Philippi, we're told that Paul and Silas and Timothy preached the Word of God, and there was a woman there who was a seller of purple whose name was Lydia. And in Acts 16, 14, somebody got that? Acts 16, 14, what does it say? The Lord, what? The Lord opened her heart so that she, what? To respond to that message. Of course, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 is another. We're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Those things recognizing again that saving faith is... A gift of grace. Now, from what we've learned or what we, we've uh, explored so far about man's fallen condition, is it any surprise that, the, that faith, saving faith, needs to be a spirit-worked thing? Is it any surprise or not? Shouldn't be, because when mankind fell into sin and Adam and became corrupt, what happened to man's will? It was wholly inclined unto evil and totally disabled from doing anything which is savingly good. And the Jews in Jesus' day are just an absolute classic example of that. We don't need to think of this just in abstract categories of, of abstract theological concepts. Just think of the Gospels. Just think of Jesus coming to his very own, but his own received him not. And as we commented again this morning, light came into the world, but the darkness did what? The darkness hated the light because its deeds were evil. So the understanding we have from the Scriptures is that mankind is blinded, alienated from God and averse to God, antagonistic to God, against God. So this action whereby people come and trust in Christ and receive Christ and embrace Christ is not a natural thing at all. It is something the Spirit of God works. Now, Granted that it is the work of the Spirit of Christ in the hearts of people, and let me ask, from what we've looked at already, 
Do you think that the Holy Spirit is able to work directly and immediately upon the human spirit, or must he use something else? Or is his work mysterious and, in a sense, immediate? Is that, do you think that's true? Does he have to come and get some kind of, uh, well, this is being a bit absurd, but he doesn't need to, to use some sort of apparatus, does some laser kind of beam? So that if I point this at Roland and press the button, perhaps it will make him a bit more holy. No, it's not that kind of thing going on. The Holy Spirit works himself immediately upon the human spirit, mysteriously, but immediately. And yet, here we're told that this grace of faith worked by the Spirit is ordinarily accomplished by the ministry of the Word. Now, I wonder if you can see how those two things go together. The Spirit himself doesn't need to call in the assistance of any man, woman, boy, or girl, or any human device to actually work upon the mind and open the hearts of people. But yet we're told here, ordinarily when it comes to saving faith, he works by the ministry of the Word. Now, why do you think that's the case? That's God's voice speaking. It's God's voice speaking, Isabel says, yes. Why, in Reformed theology in particular, do we place so much emphasis on connecting the Spirit's work with the Word in the acts of salvation? The Holy Spirit works directly. And I think that's true. He works immediately upon Merlin's spirit, my spirit. But yet, in producing saving faith, that is, that trust and dependence on Christ, he also uses the ministry of the word. Why is that? Yeah, that's, that's I mean, that's just really saying what I'm saying, though. <laughs> it's just simply saying that the word is the sword the spirit uses. But can you see logically how this happens, or why this happens. Why the two are so connected? Why they ordinarily work? Yep, that, that's, that is also true. At a practical level, we'd be led astray if we just followed the Spirit. Okay, let me put it like this. If we likened human blindness, spiritual blindness, to one of those thick cataracts that can cover the eye, okay? A thick cataract that covers the eye and impairs the vision. Now, when the Holy Spirit works to give light and illumination to our minds and our hearts, what does he do? Does he actually himself beam directly the truths and the propositions afresh into our mind and heart? Or does he simply take away the cataract so that the renewed eye can now see? That's ordinarily the way he works. And it's very, very important to see that. You see, in the act of illumination, in the act of bringing John to saving faith, the Holy Spirit didn't give John a personalized revelation of the facts of the gospel. That, that correct? He didn't beam suddenly all of that message of the gospel into John's mind and heart. John had probably heard it from his mother and father for many, many, many years. The truths were all there. And perhaps John was never conscious of a moment of greater dawning, greater light, but many of us have been. We've been raised, and the truths are there, but the Spirit's work is to repair the eyesight so that we can suddenly see, and to take away the stony heart so that we can respond and embrace. Now, that is why in creating saving faith, the Spirit works alongside the Word. The Spirit doesn't give a fresh revelation of truth and fact 
to every individual person. He's already given it once in the Scriptures. And they are His Word. And so His Word is there, but He works in the eye and in the heart so that now, beholding that wonderful Word, we can respond to the truth. Now, have you got that? Does that make sense to you? Otherwise, you see, we end up saying that what happens in the conversion or saving faith of an individual is not simply illumination, but fresh, what? Not only illumination, but immediate revelation. Revelation as well. But that's not how the Spirit ordinarily works in saving faith. He illumines, takes the cataract away, and perhaps opens our understanding so we can rightly perceive and interpret the truth, but ordinarily he doesn't give a fresh revelation of the facts. He uses the existing revelation and works alongside that. Just enables us to see it and to believe it now. But okay? So, when Jesus asks the disciples in Matthew 16, Whom do men say that I am? And some say, John the Baptist, some the prophet, etc. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. They, you see, had been seeing Jesus act just like other people had. But God had opened their eyes so that Jesus could again say, blessed are your eyes because they see. Many have longed to see these things but haven't been able to. Okay? So, saving faith is the work of the Spirit of Christ in the hearts of the elect, ordinarily accomplished by, through, with, alongside the ministry of the Word, so that you're hearing things and suddenly you hear. You're seeing things and suddenly you see with a saving sight. Fair enough? So that's the source of faith. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in the depths of the soul, taking away the blindness, the rebellion, and the resistance. Now, not only does the confession talk about where it comes from, but how it's strengthened. It says, it is also increased and strengthened by the word, by prayer, and by the administration of the sacraments. Do you think it's true that faith can be weak faith? Did Jesus rebuke his disciples for having what? O ye of little faith. Hebrews chapter 5. Let's have a look at that for a moment, can we? Hebrews chapter 5. You remember there's a verse or two here. The writer of the book of Hebrews, verse 11, says... He's just been speaking about the priesthood of Jesus. He says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need somebody to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Well, while that doesn't speak specifically about weak and strong faith, it certainly does speak about people that had not reached a stage of spiritual maturity that they need. Over in Romans chapter 10, you remember, I'll just quote this, Paul says, faith comes by what? By hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If faith really is that power and ability and grace whereby we believe and lay hold of, we'll talk a little bit more about the constituent elements of faith in a moment or two, do you think that that's likely to be strengthened as we learn more and more and more and more about the object of our faith? Do you think uh, yeah, this, this kind of thing, 
I might come to a bridge that's looking weathered, an old wooden bridge that's looking thoroughly weathered, and I've just got this new vehicle and I'm questioning whether I should drive it across it. As I take a look at that, just from the approach, it looks a bit rickety. But if I get a decent knife out, a hunting knife out, and begin to dig round in some of the members, stand back and note underneath that it's got steel bearers underneath, etc. It's only got wooden cladding. Do you think the more and more and more I know about that, the more confident I'm likely to be in that? Do you think the more and more and more we know and understand of the love of God, the grace of God, the power of God, the mercy of God, the more and more our faith in Him is strengthened? Do you think Helma loves Gus more and more and more every year just simply because she sees him getting older and older and older? Or do you think she gets to know him more and more and more? That should be the way, okay? We love trust as we get to know more and more. And that's what we've got here. Just as it is brought into being by the ministry of the Word, so it is increased and strengthened by the Word, by prayer, and by the administration of the sacraments. We can understand how the Word strengthens faith because it tells us more and more about the object of our faith. Is that, that right? More and more about the... What about prayer, though? How can prayer, do you think, strengthen our faith? Caleb, how do you think prayer is a means of strengthening faith? We can see it One thing is we can actually see prayers answered. Uh, Kynan and uh, Sam and I are learning as a memory verse for this week, which they have to know by tomorrow, Ephesians 6.18 which in the New King James Version says, Kainan, praying always, you'll get it right this time, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Last week we were talking a little bit about what it means to pray in the Spirit. And uh, when we are enabled to pray by the Holy Spirit, there is this, I think, most wonderful sense of immediate communion with God that is part of the Spirit giving this absolute assurance. Remember way back at the beginning of our study of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and Alison, you should know this because you got this answer right, I think, in your exam. Ultimately, our confidence that the Bible is the Word of God doesn't just depend upon the outward evidences, but in the end, it's dependent on what, Alison? It is upon, we are dependent for that infallible assurance that this is the Word of God by what? By Himself. It's from Himself. That's the ground of authority, but the Holy Spirit working within our souls in, by, and through the Word. Not apart from it, but in, by, and through it. And the Holy Spirit gives to us this profound assurance that this is the Word of God. So that we don't need somebody to tell us it is, because God himself burns that into our minds. Now, that same thing happens, I believe, as we are enabled to pray in the Spirit. We are enabled as we pray through and by means of the Word of God to have that profound assurance that God is real. And God hears prayer. And there's peace and joy in his presence evermore. So prayer itself can be a wonderful means of grace. Generally speaking, I believe those two things go together. You seldom find great, strong, confident, trusting, childlike, simple faith in God simply by people who read a lot. It ordinarily dwells in people who not only speak with or listen to the Word of God speak, but speak to the God of the Word as well. It's those two things. Hearing God speak to us and then speaking back. And it's in that intimacy of fellowship and communion that's built up. What about this? Administration of the sacraments. How in the world do they strengthen faith? Gus, you've been here the last two or three Sunday nights when I've been trying to talk about this. How do the sacraments... How are they a means of increasing and strengthening faith? They just remind us on Christ's work. Okay, they remind us of Christ's work. What else? The sacraments are really what? 
Come on, Catherine, you've been there as well. They are really... Well, well, that, that's good. They're means of grace. That's great. That's great. That's what we're talking about here. But how do they become means of grace? Adrian? Physical affirmation of the spiritual. That's right, because they're really a physical affirmation or a physical representation of the spiritual realities. They are simply the gospel being preached visibly in signs to us. They don't add anything to the word, but they do address our senses. And in that way, they're able to strengthen our faith or be the means of strengthening faith. Okay, so much then for the source and means of faith. Now, why don't we just look a little bit now at the nature and activity of faith. I've got to keep pressing on or Darby's not going to get home to his football. <laughs> Joke, my daughter's laughing. Anyway, let's look at this, the nature and activity of faith. By this faith, the confession says, this faith that the Spirit of God produces in us, opening our eyes, softening our hearts, it's a fruit of regeneration. By this faith, firstly this, a Christian believes to be true whatever is revealed in the Word on account of the authority of God Himself speaking in it. Now that's the bit we've just touched on. And I think the confession is very beautiful here because it speaks of fidei generalis. That's the Latin term for firstly a general faith. When the Holy Spirit works in us, opening our eyes, confirming the word of God to us, do you think when that regenerating work takes place that we only believe some parts of the Bible? Or that it has that effect of enabling us to believe because of God's authority, this is his word. Okay, it does. The whole of it. And uh, this is what's being said here. By this faith that the Spirit of God works within, a Christian believes to be true whatever is revealed in the Word. On account of the authority of God Himself speaking in it. Now that comes back to that very first chapter. It is the Spirit of God that gives us a deep assurance that the Bible is the Word of God. And we know with a Spirit-wrought assurance this is God's truth. Because God Himself speaks to it or to us through it and with it. And where that Spirit-produced faith really is, it produces a general faith. Able to trust in the Word of God because it's God's Word. And... Look at this. This is the interesting part here as well. By this faith, the Christian believes to be true. And here's the second part. And acts differently upon that which each particular passage contains. Yielding obedience to the command, commands, tremblings at the threat, and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. These are three of the different aspects of the scriptures that are there. There are commands, there are warnings, there are promises. And as God works by His Holy Spirit in us and produces that faith, faith responds appropriately to the different objects. Does that make sense to you? It obeys commands, it trembles at warnings, and it also rejoices and embraces the promises of God. Correct? So that's what true faith will do as it reads the Word, studies the Word, hears the Word. Will it respond appropriately to each part? Any question about that? Comment on that. Do you think that's true? Boy, everybody's slow tonight. Anyway, it is true. Righto. It carries on, however, to say this. But... The chief actions of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting on Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. Now this is really important. This is talking about the faith that leads to salvation. Here, the confession of faith says the chief actions of saving faith. 
the faith that leads unto salvation. What saving faith does is embrace Christ. Not just a general belief in there being a God and that God's the creator, but saving faith looks out beyond itself and embraces Christ as the Lamb of God that takes away our sins. And it, Commission uses this term here, these terms. It says, the chief actions of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting on Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life. As theologians have tried to understand and take to pieces what is involved in faith, kind of trying to dissect it and say, can we split faith up into its different parts? They generally speak of three things, necessary, essential, and involved in faith. What do you think the first thing is? The first thing involved in true biblical faith is... No, 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 no. We're talking about just the activity of faith. No, no. The first thing, in order for there to be a truly intelligent biblical faith. No, no, just... No, no, no. Well, that's good. Getting some responses now. Christine said we've got to believe that there is a God. No, I'm just talking about the actual activity of faith. I'm not talking about what it believes in, like believing there's a God. I'm just talking about faith. Yeah, knowledge is the first thing. You see, some people today in, see, see faith over against knowledge. And they just basically say, you just have faith. Have faith. A leap in the dark. That's it. It is an ex existentialist kind of leap in the dark. Just have faith, man. Woman, have faith. Now that leads to a sentimental, mystical kind of leap in the dark. That's all. Biblical faith is always a response to revelation. Now that revelation is commonly concerning things that are not seen. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things that are not seen. So faith, the first element of faith, is knowledge. And, and that's a wonderful thing. Biblical faith is not just, well, you know, it's okay for you. You've just got faith. Isabel's just got faith. No, that's not the way biblical saving faith works. Biblical saving faith has to do with an object, something out there. And it's got to be founded first on knowledge. So knowledge is the first. What do you think the second one is? We've got, we've got underway. Rule's got us underway with knowledge. I wonder if anybody else can lead us on. Come on, Gus. You're smiling up there. You must see the second one. Do you think... Sorry? Responding with the heart. Why to say it's responding with the heart. Okay. We'll leave that just on the side here for a moment. We'll flag it and put that over here. Anybody? No, that's content again. That's content. We're thinking more just of activity. Yeah, okay. Now, you using what word? Trust. Well, we'll leave that for a moment also. Flag it over here. Well, put that down with knowledge. So under, Christine's mentioned understanding. Do you think that people can know something, but... The fact that you know something, do you necessarily agree with it or assent to it? Okay, did you get that right? Caleb knew it, did he? Well done, Caleb. You're shy. Speak up, big loud voice. The second thing that theologians talk about is assent. Faith involves, firstly, knowing something. Secondly, also assent in the, in the sense of conviction. Knowledge leading to a conviction that something is truth. Now, what do you think the third thing is in this threefold element, if you like, of, uh, of faith, as theologians have tried to understand it? Knowledge, assent, the third is John. What do you think? Hamish? 
Action. Yeah, action. What's it going to be? Trust, trust, trust. Knowledge, assent, and trust. He that comes to me, Jesus said, shall never hunger. He that eats of this bread, an element of action, and that action involving a whole-souled response, an appropriate response. You see, if the gospel basically was simply trying to tell us that 2 plus 2 equals 4, we could learn that, we could agree that with that, and we could probably leave that. Could, could we not? In many cases, we'd say, well, I, I, I see it, I know it, and I agree with it, and that's fine. You can just put it on the side. But the Scriptures come to us, and what they are saying or urging us to believe is this. Number one, there is a Creator God who is sovereign Lord and demands complete obedience of all His creatures. That's the first thing. Second thing it's telling us is that all we like sheep have what? Gone astray and turned each and every one of us to our own way and have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. It tells us that we are, on account of our sin, condemned to death. It also tells us in this wonderful gospel that God in grace and mercy has set forth His Son to be an atoning sacrifice and it also says to us, whoever believes and rests on him alone for righteousness shall be saved. So the gospel, in what it tells us about ourselves and about Christ, demands a response. We can't just say, well, two and two equals four, that's fine, we'll leave it there. The gospel says you're under wrath. Repent Turn from that, embrace Christ, trust and rest in Him alone as Savior from sin. And that requires a response, doesn't it? That requires a response of complete reliance upon the Savior, the crucified Savior, for right standing with God. That's a deliberate, conscious act of trust. So saving faith involves those things. How can, they, how can they be saved without a what? Without a, a preacher? How can they hear? How can they believe without hearing? So they require knowledge. They require also the Spirit of God to open their eyes so that they can believe that truth and see it and understand it. But they need also the grace to be able to respond in believing trust and confidence. So these are beautiful words that... The confession of faith uses the chief actions of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting on Christ alone. Now, that's much more than simply knowing information, much more than even just nodding your head to it. You see, non-Christians, nominal Christians, by the thousand can do that. But to come to Christ... And to actually lay your burden upon Him and put your whole confidence in Him for eternal life. It's not something the natural man can do, wants to do, or will do. Some of you have probably heard the story of Blondin. Is it, well, what's the name of that tightrope walker who was across at a time? You've heard that? Charles Blondin. You've all heard about that story? And what's the story? People have stood there watching him walk across the tightrope over the Niagara. You heard that? And he gets to the other side or comes back again and people are going, ooh, ah, oh, what a marvellous walker. And he says this, do you believe that I could push somebody in a wheelbarrow across there? And people say, yes. And he says, hop in, hop in. <laughs> And that's the kind of difference. That's what saving faith is. Do you believe that Jesus is a savior from sinners? Yes. Even the devils do that. Even the devils do that. Hop in. Trust him. 
abandon all confidence in your own works, faith, righteousness, all those things. Trust Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life. Okay? So what that is saying is this faith that is worked by the Spirit alongside the Word, Word and Spirit working together to create faith results in a complete trusting in all that God reveals in His Word, but its principal acts, the chief actions of saving faith, are accepting, receiving, and resting on Christ alone. Happy with it? That, that's what saving faith is. Last thing, just quickly we need to look at, and then we'll take a break, and that is a comment on the degrees of faith, which we've already touched on. Yes, sir. Um, I suppose these basic people talk more about being born again. Yes. Does the formation of faith or recognition of faith pick that up anywhere or uh, they, they kind of uh, explain it this way? It's very closely related to death. Yes, that is the same thing. The, Gus has just asked, people talk a lot today about being born again based on John chapter 3. Does the confession of faith pick that up at all. It, it, it doesn't use, number one, it doesn't use the language. It doesn't use the actual expression being born again, excuse me, being born again. But in the section on effectual calling, and in this kind of section, it's all through that. This work of the Spirit creating faith is, is regen, the other theological term is regeneration. So that's what it's referring to. Uh, saving faith is a fruit of being regenerated, being born again. It's one of the differences between Arminian theology and Reformed theology. Arminian theology uh, oftentimes says, well, believe and you'll be born again. Uh, Reformed theology says, how in the world can a blind sinner believe? How in the world can a heart which is the enmity with God come and rest entirely upon Christ for saving faith. Can't do that. It's only as the Spirit of God works, only as people are taught of God and drawn of God that they actually can believe. So that's the way it speaks of the regenerating, renewing work of the Spirit. Good question, Gus. Okay, quickly, a couple of minutes, and we'll just have a look at this. Degrees of faith. This faith... Article 3 goes on, says, has different degrees of strength and weakness. It may be attacked and weakened often and in many ways. Do you think it's a common feature of Christian life that people can go through periods of doubt? Serious doubt. Sometimes as to whether the Bible is true. Certainly as to whether they themselves are converted. I mean, that can be a very real thing, and we'll pick that up again when we look at assurance. But even in terms of this resting, relying, and trusting on Christ for salvation, you think that people can go through doubts and questions in their mind that Jesus really died an atoning death for sinners? You know, there's all sorts of doubts that can come. And that is especially so when... We neglect means of grace or when God in his providence allows us as his children to be deeply challenged and tested. People can go through some very, very tough times, but it says it gets the victory. Now, that kind of affirmation is based on statements like Jesus, where Jesus says that no man shall be able to pluck out of his hands those the Father gives him. In John 6, we've already read, This is the will of the Father, that of all that he has given me, I should, what? Lose none, but raise them up on the last day. It is part of that covenant engagement between the Father and the Son that the Son will not lose any the Father has given him. And it's that kind of thing that gives us profound assurance as a Christian. If you ask me, do I have hope of persevering to the end? We deal with this again in perseverance and preservation. I'd say, yes, I have great hope of persevering to the end. But if you ask, what basis have you got for that? That you can still read and think and study and believe? I'd say, not that. In the end, my confidence of persevering to the end 
lies in Jesus' commitment to his Father that he's not going to lose any the Father's given him. Now that's a great solid plank for believing that we'll persevere to the end. Okay? So that's the sort of thing we're dealing with here. Okay? This faith can experience varying kinds. It says, in many believers, it matures and becomes completely assured through Christ who both creates and perfects our faith. Now, we will pick up and look at assurance as a separate article in two weeks' time. I think it's one of the, uh, the most comforting and loveliest chapters in the entire Confession of Faith, the one on assurance. This is just simply saying faith can be go through fluctuations, can be weak or it can be strong. Uh, and some believers, however, it can become completely assured, steady, strong, and undisturbed in their souls. Okay? Well, here we are. Faith. That grace that enables us to see, to believe, to trust, to embrace, is a gift of God's grace, worked in us through the Holy Spirit who enables us to see and love and see the desirability and draws us to embrace these things. Okay, any last questions? Let's take a break. Uh, yes? situation here of being attacked and weakened in its faith. Yes? That's mainly to neglect the means of grace. Yes, I think that, um, num number one, in terms of the attack on faith, the proof text you'll see in the Confession of Faith includes Ephesians chapter 6, which speaks of the fiery darts of the evil one. And he is the accuser of the brethren. And his darts can come any time. I think I've told you, <clears throat> may have told this particular group that I, I was traveling to Australia to speak at a conference and went for a mid-flight walk and was looking out the back portal. It was a daytime flight. We're at 35,000 feet. And we were out over just an endless mass of water. Some of you have seen that. You've been up in the plane, seen? And as I saw the sun glinting on all of those tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of wave crests, the question went through my mind, can God possibly know what's happening in all of those waves? Can he possibly be in his providence, governing, controlling, and directing. And I went through a bit of a mid-flight crisis. Not mid-life crisis, but mid-flight crisis. Here I was going to be preaching God's Word. And I was knowing specific questions, real doubts. And they were exactly the kind of fiery doubts of the evil one. That kind of thing can be attacked. And if we entertain those things... Faith can be weakened. I think of another illustration of that. G. Campbell Morgan was the predecessor of Martin Lloyd Jones at Westminster Chapel, and for many years he was a fine, marvelous Bible teacher and drew big crowds there to listen to him. But near the or in the early part of the 19th century, when lots of books were coming out on a higher, higher critical approach to the Scriptures, uh, challenging and questioning whether the miracles really took place. He began to read these books. And the evil one began to use the uh, unbelieving presupposition of that to create doubts in his mind. And the more he read, the more disturbed and uncertain his faith became. And his daughter, who writes his biography, says that he reached a point where he locked his books up in a cabinet and said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the Bible right through, and if by the end of reading the Bible right through by itself, I've still got doubts, I'll get the books out again. He went down to a bookstore, got just a very common, simple version of the Bible. He just wanted one completely unmarked, completely unfamiliar to him as a visual reader of it. He said before he got to the end of the book of Genesis, he'd emptied his cupboard and burnt them all because the very word of God itself with its self-attesting witness had confirmed the truth of that. Now, that is another instance of where faith may be weakened 
where we do, in fact, indulge ourselves or engage ourselves in error or flirt with error or, well, you've even got in First Timothy, haven't you, the warnings there of these disputes and old wives' tales which Timothy says produce only dissensions and not faith and love. So you can get sidetracked. I think his, his hands here even. I think that, uh, and I'll say this bravely even with Hans here, but I think if you just spent all your time looking at evidences in the scientific realm as well, you can potentially begin to get a bit unsettled. Would that be right, Hans? I think that you can. Because... In the end, you're ending up with all of these doubts and things that are coming up and all these claims and counterclaims, and unless you've got your head just in the sand and have got a prejudiced, fixed mindset, you've got to weigh these things up. And uh, engaging with error can be a source of the weakening of faith. And the wisest minds in theology have said that uh, you've got to be very, very, very careful in engaging with erroneous writings. Because no matter how big, bold, and strong you seem to be, there's a cunning and wiser evil one that's wanting to undergird that. So, indulging in sin, neglecting means of grace, flirting with error, all of those things create situations of where we can be seriously weakened in our faith and attacked in it and end up a bit of a wreck. Uh, is that Okay. My father's just an illustration of that. Just before my father died, he was raised in a church setting, went to Bible class, was an elder in the church for many, many years, and his latter years became thoroughly confused. Now, I don't know whether my dad was a true believer or not, but I do know that he had reached a point in his uh, early 70s where he just was so confused with all that he'd heard that he just didn't know what was true after all. And uh, so those things are serious. Okay? Let's uh, eat and drink. We'll come back 10 minutes and then have a look at the sections on repentance. All right. Now, I began our session tonight just by saying that all of these things do fit together and we need to see the application of redemption as bringing about this great change. Do you think that one of the most crucial things that needs to happen if we're to be reconciled to God is that, number one, we actually see and believe what he says? Surely that's one of the most basic things, isn't it? So... The Spirit's great work in restoring us and quickening us and wakening us, saving faith is absolutely crucial to creating a new man. I mean, if, if Gus's children just, uh, Gus came out to them in the morning and says, uh, Christian, uh, we're going to town this afternoon. Chris says, don't believe you. <laughs> and uh, said to Jessica, Jessica, um, uh, your mum and I are going away for three days. No, you're not. And, you know, if they didn't believe, if, if they just plain didn't believe anything mum and dad said, how in the world are you going to be able to function together? Well, here we've got living God who's spoken and revealed himself to us. If people don't believe that Jesus is the Christ... If people don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, how in the world can the Father be happy? So it's absolutely crucial in the restoration of mankind to himself that people's eyes are opened, that they believe the true and living God when he speaks. So that's why saving faith is so crucial. Now the other thing, of course, is not simply believing in the truth, but turning away from unrighteousness. Do you think it's consistent with God bringing children to himself that, oh, yes, you can believe and get your sins forgiven, but you can carry on in the pig pen? 
No, it's absolutely incompatible. That's why repentance and faith both belong together and you cannot have people being saved without repentance. But more upon that. That's why we come now to look at repentance. The first article deals with preaching repentance. It says this, Repentance which leads to life is the blessed product of the gospel. This is this uh, newer translation of it. I've pretty much come to the conclusion I'm going to go back to the original text. The more I compare what I've been using up here in the text, the more I like the original one. So there's parts of this that I've taken just straight back to the original, but this is this newer, more modern text. It says, Repentance which leads to life is the blessed product of the gospel working in believers' lives. That's fair enough. Along with the doctrine of faith in Christ, it is a doctrine to be preached by every minister of the gospel. First thing that's saying is that repentance is a grace, an evangelical grace. Just a couple of references to help us see this. One of the most uh, important that I've uh, come across in this regards in Acts chapter 5 verse 31. Peter is addressing the Sanhedrin here, and he says, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God, this is verse 29 of Acts 5, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, now look at this, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. That he, from the right hand of God the Father, might give repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now, in order to see the importance of that, you've got to go back to the first part of Luke's uh, writings, which of course is the Gospel according to Luke. In the 24th chapter of Luke, Jesus says to the disciples, he opens their understanding to uh, understand the scriptures, and he told them, verse 46 of Luke 24, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's how Jesus told his disciples the gospel would go out. An integral part of the gospel is repentance and forgiveness. They go together repentance and forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name. It's in connection with what Christ has done as the Savior, but repentance and the forgiveness of sins go hand in hand. One other reference that might be of interest here. Uh, Acts, again, back in the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 18, Peter's in Jerusalem explaining what's happened in Cornelius' house household and how Cornelius this Gentile has believed. And Peter just recites everything that had happened in Cornelius' household. In verse 18 it says, When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, What? So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. God has granted even the, repent the, the, the Gentiles. This is, he could well have said, God has granted the Gentiles saving faith. Could have said that. But he says, no, he's granted them repentance unto life. Knowing that it's only in this radical turning away from a life of devotion to sin and to Satan that people can be reconciled to God and saved. So those things are there. Perhaps one more. 2 Timothy, interesting one. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. Paul writes this to Timothy, he says, those who oppose him, or he's talking about the servant of the Lord, verse 24, that's a preacher, teacher, pastor, shepherd. He says, the Lord's servant must not quarrel, instead he must be kind to everyone and able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. He says, you deal gently with those people. And he's talking there about antagonistic Gentiles in all probability, like those that had caused the riot in Ephesus. He says, you patiently teach them, 
trusting that God will grant them repentance unto life. It's something that comes from God, God's grace. It's a fruit also of regeneration, working in the heart. Being born again will show itself in repentance, okay? Now, the confession says, along with the doctrine of faith in Christ, it is a doctrine to be preached by every minister of the gospel. Why do you think they put that in there? Probably because what? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not only probably not preached, but it's also harder to preach. Isn't that correct? Urging people, you must repent. Repentance, and we'll see here, there's no grace, there's no virtue, no merit in repentance. It doesn't earn anything with God, but it's an integral element of true faith, a turning to God. And without it, there's no salvation. Without it, we're not going to have our peace restored. But it is, it is not an easy thing to preach. And as Robert Raymond says in his new book, In Systematic Theology, it has been the absence of penetrating, particular preaching of repentance that has given rise to easy believism in the church today. Believe in Jesus as your Redeemer and Savior. Who wouldn't? You know, just if, if it was only that promissory kind of side of things. Okay, repentance needs to be preached. And it's not, I don't think, preached very penetratingly and challengingly as a rule in our churches today. But more about that in a moment. We come on to look at the second article, which is repentance described. Now, this is one that does merit close study, and I was talking to Darby in the break, saying to him that I think that if those of us that are entrusted with the task of preaching repentance, or it's not just those that publicly preach it, people that are working with people in EE, evangelism explosion, that kind of thing. You know, that's why I think it's so critically important that not only do we hold before people the promise of eternal life, but we also make clear to them that narrow is the gate, straight is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. But I was saying to Darby that all of us need to understand how repentance works and what it is if we are to minister God's word in a way that's adapted to that deep work of repentance taking place. Now, look what we've got up here. It says, by it, that is, by this grace that God gives, this grace of repentance, by it, look at this, out of the sight and sense, not only of the danger, but also of the filthiness or odiousness and hatefulness of his sins as contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God, and upon understanding that God in Christ is merciful to those who repent, so grieves for and hates his sins as to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the way of his commandments. Wow, man, what a mouthful. This is a tremendous statement, absolutely packed with uh, important ideas. Now, I've outlined it on the right by saying the immediate occasion and the specific nature. I'm not sure that that's correct, but the first part of that statement is talking about what it is that disposes the heart to the act of repentance. The word repent or it's most commonly translated repent in the New Testament, means to have a change of mind or to change of heart. So, in a sense, it's this latter part down here that describes the specific act of repentance, grieving for, hating sin, turning from them, etc. But this first part tells us of how that act of repentance comes about. And it says this, by it, by this grace of repentance that God gives, what happens? Firstly, a sinner out of the sight and sense. 
This is connected, you see, with regeneration. And as the Spirit of God opens our minds to see the holiness of God, the searching character of His law, and as He softens our heart to those things, He produces deep within us a sight and a sense. That is, He's talking about not just knowing it in your brain that you're a sinner, but actually profoundly feeling it. Deeply and profoundly feeling it. Out of a sight and sense, not only of the danger, but also of the filthiness and hatefulness of his sins, as contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God. Again, men that have studied and thought deeply about repentance have spoken about legal repentance. And they've described legal repentance, or as Paul speaks about this, the sorrow of the world as being essentially a fear, a dread, or a sorrow that arises, what? Out of a threat of penalty, or personal loss, or gain. Can we turn just for a second? No, very quickly, just in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Probably the most detailed little discussion on the nature of repentance can be found in 2 Corinthians 7. As Paul writes the second uh, recorded letter, probably his fifth in total, fourth or fifth in total, to the Corinthians, one of the things that um, he is trying to redress, or not redress, but certainly wants to address, is the sorrow that an earlier letter had caused them. And... Uh, in the, what have we got here? In verse 8, he says, of chapter 7, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. So what he'd done was written a letter, it had hurt them, made them sorry, and he was thinking, oopsie, oopsie, I shouldn't have written that letter. But he saw it made them sorry only for a short time because it led to a repentance not to be repented of, he talks about, not to be sorry about. And so as he's seen the effects of this letter, he's been filled with joy. But he adds this, for you became sorrowful as God intended and so were not harmed in any way by us. You see, if, if I let loose with an explosive bit of passion at Christine Whitten here and tell her that she really is the most rotten person under the sun, which I wouldn't do, but she would be hurt and she would be justly hurt. But if I was to say to Christine, uh, if there was a particular sin of Christine's that uh, I knew she wasn't addressing, but I don't know, so relax, Christine. <laughs> but if I was to say to a Christine, that is not right, and she got in a huff with me, and she went away, okay, I'd be a bit sorry that she was upset, but if God did her wor his work in her heart, I wouldn't be sorry after that, nor would you. Because that's the kind of sorrow God wanted and intended, and you're not harmed by it in the end, right? You are helped by that, not harmed by it. And Paul goes on, 10th verse, he says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. He goes on to say, See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. See, those are fruits of true repentance. But he says, worldly sorrow leads to death. Now, Theologians, pastors over the years, have again and again seen people have come to them and says, Oh, I've sinned, Pastor Vosker saying, I've sinned terribly. And they're in a shape because they know that they've stolen something and really the police are on their tail. 
and they're afraid of the outcome of that and they're sorry in that regard but do you think that they're really sorry in their hearts against God? Remember David in Psalm 51. If Psalm 51 was written after David's sin against Bathsheba and Uriah, you would think that David would say, perhaps in his prayer, or had reason to say, Lord, against Uriah and against Bathsheba I have sinned. But does he say that? What does he say? Against you and you only have I son sinned and done this evil in your sight. He knows that ultimately his deepest guilt is in sinning against God and rebelling against his holiness and his holy law. And the issue is ultimately not remorse like Judas felt for betraying Jesus, but a profound and awesome sorrow for sin against God. Now, this is what this confession is getting at here, and it says, by it, out of a sight and sense, not only of the danger, it's valid for us to be scared out of our wits of the danger of sin. Who wouldn't be afraid of the wrath of eternal almighty God? Dread and fear and threat of wrath is a valid motive in seeking to produce godly repentance. Proper to say. I mean, people today, what do they ridicule? They ridicule these old fire and brimstone preachers as though they belong really in the prehistoric museums. No place for them today. I don't think that's correct. I think it's a very, very valid thing to warn people to flee from the wrath of an incensed, holy God. But repentance doesn't stop simply at sorrow and dread of danger. But it also is conscious of the filthiness of sin or its odiousness and the hatefulness of their sins as contrary to the holy nature and the righteous law of God. Okay, that's one part of it. This is how repentance works. It gives people a sight and sense of the seriousness of their sins. Not just the danger, but of how contrary they are to God. And also, this grace of repentance gives an understanding that God and Christ is merciful to those who repent. Now, this is the other side, you see, of the grace of repentance. Do you think that if we only proclaim to people a God with thunder and fire and lightning coming out from him, that people are going to be encouraged to turn from their sins to seek his mercy and repent? No, they're not. But true repentance comes as people not only see the odiousness and hatefulness of their sins, as contrary to the holy nature of God and the law of God, but it comes about also as they see his mercy offered in Christ. There is a sacrifice. I love the hymn, Eternal Light, Eternal Light. A verse that goes, Oh, how shall I, whose native sphere is dark, whose mind is dim, before the ineffable appear and on my naked spirit bear the uncreated light? How can I? How can I, such a sinner, appear before God? And then it goes on. There is a way for man to rise to that sublime abode, an offering and a sacrifice, a Holy Spirit's energies, an advocate with God. You see, repentance not only sees the threatenings, the defilement, but it also sees the mercy of God, the grace of God, the Spirit's energies. And in view of those things, what happens? Repentance, the grace of repentance, produces within us a grief and hatred of sin. But not only that, a turning from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with Him in all the ways of His commandments. That's a pretty great thing, I think, what re repentance involves. Not just simply smothering ourselves and saying, oh, I've sinned, I've sinned, I'm under judgment, I've failed. 
but recognizing in God the mercy that's offered and a turning to him to be washed and cleansed and renewed and empowered and endeavoring and purposing. Purposing means to set your mind on. Purposing means to attempt. Setting your mind upon and attempting and endeavoring to walk in all the ways of his commandments. Okay. That is how the confession of faith describes repentance. A turning. A turning that involves grief and hatred for sin. A turning that embraces the offered mercy in Christ. A turning that seeks to observe all God's ways and all his commandments. A deep work grace in the soul. Do you think that repentance is only a once thing that happens just at the beginning of life? Do you think it's something we also need constantly? Indeed it does. Do you think we are likely to see much progress in sanctification if that first part is not also an action? I don't think so. I don't think we're going to see today people turning from the idols and sins of the age until... By the grace of God, they are enabled to see the holiness of God, the absolute filthiness of that sin, really, in his sight, and the absolute righteous requirements of the law of God. People are not going to see their sin until the light is turned on. And that's a great task, I think, that is before us in the age in which we live. Challenging task. A scary task, an unpopular task, all of those things. To get our sleeves rolled up and to actually get down into the depths of the filth of our culture, of our society, and of our hearts. And to begin to bring the light of God's word upon those things. Help people see the absolute holiness of his character. That's why one of the great needs, I think, today is still to preach on the character of God. His utter perfection, his utter wisdom, his utter love, his utter grace, his utter mercy. All those things. Preach the character and attributes of God. And over against that you say, how in the world can such a God as that have anything to do with sinners such as me? And we hold Christ out to saint and to sinner and say there is a way for us to rise to that sublime abode. An offering and a sacrifice, the Holy Spirit's energies, an advocate with God. Come freshly in repentance. Seek his grace, his mercy, his renewing. So there's no place for Christians to be arrogant. Every single one of us should be experiencing every single day the brokenness and the experience of renewed life as we repent afresh and come endeavoring and purposing to walk in all the ways of his commandments. That's what the Christian life is. That's how sanctification happens. Okay? So we grow in holiness through a constant process of repenting and believing. Okay, another couple of things. Most of the rest of these things are really quite short, and we don't need to necessarily say too much about them. Here we are, the necessity of repentance. This is Article 3 of Chapter 15. The confession says, although repentance is not any satisfaction for sin, what does that mean? Repentance is not any satisfaction for sin. Sorry? Yeah, we need to be forgiven, but this is technical language. Satisfaction... It doesn't pay for it. It doesn't satisfy the justice and demands of God. Just because God says, hey, Michael, you've repented. Well, that knocks out ten sins on that day. There's no satisfaction in sin, no inherent merit in repentance. Although repentance is not any satisfaction for sin and does not cause the forgiveness of sins, okay, it doesn't cause sin to be forgiven. Hey, you repent. Therefore, because you've repented, God will now forgive you. You've done your part, he'll do his. 
<laughs> no. It, it doesn't provide a substitute, doesn't it provide atonement. It, repentance doesn't contribute to your forgiveness. Nor does it cause it, since forgiveness is an act of God's voluntary grace in Christ. Nothing we can do will make God forgive us or lays any claim on God to forgive us. Yet, it says, it is necessary to all sinners and no one may be expected to be forgiven without it. So it doesn't cause it. It doesn't create any merit. But unless there is that humbling, turning away from sin, come, let us reason together, God said to Israel, though your sins be as scarlet, they be as white as snow. But come, you've got to come. And you've got to understand these things. Necessary to all sinners, and no one may expect to be forgiven without it. Next article, the effectiveness and particularity of repentance. I think I've got two sections in your notes on this, but I've joined them together on the overhead. Look at what the first one says. Just as there is no sin so small that it doesn't deserve damnation. Do you think that's true? There's no sin so small that it doesn't deserve damnation. Just a little one. Just a little one, Lord. Our white lies. <laughs> you know? But it says, so there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. That's a tremendous comfort. There's no sin so great. What did the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy, how did he describe himself? He was what? A blasphemer? A violent man? That was the third one. Uh, but he just basically says, Why did God have mercy on me? He had mercy on me, such a sinner, the chief of sinners, so that others might have hope and comfort as well. So Paul himself is acknowledging the vastness and greatness of his sin. But upon those who truly repent, there's no sin so great that can bring damnation on those who... That, that's a comfort. Now, what about this? Specific. Specificity. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Jesus said before that uh, we we'll seem to get the Holy Spirit. Hey, I knew somebody would bring that up. <laughs> hey, hey, yes, sir. Sin against the Holy Spirit shall never, ever be forgiven. Now, I think that's true. Notice this down here. It says, upon those who truly repent. To sin against the Holy Spirit, whatever that means, ultimately. I don't think it's just saying, well... You just believe in the Holy Spirit or you don't believe that's of the Holy Spirit. I think that the sin against the Holy Spirit is a profound thing that involves us rejecting and denying his whole work and efficacy um, and, and is necessarily going to lead us to unbelief and rejection, to deny the Holy Spirit. To sin against the Holy Spirit is to remain in unbelief. Uh, now this is saying, look, there's no sin so great that those who truly repent can't be forgiven. People who sin against the Holy Spirit are not going to repent and won't repent and don't repent. They won't be forgiven. Because, you see, repentance is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Sinning against the Holy Spirit is rejecting the Holy Spirit. It is completely denying and turning against the gospel. And... Uh, that kind of person who willfully, willingly knows and yet rejects the gospel, that line of apostasy, they, they won't be forgiven because they'll never repent. They can't repent because the Holy Spirit uh, is the author of true repentance. All right, Gus, that, that's sort of a sequence there. This point down here says this, believers should not be satisfied with general repentance, rather... It is everyone's duty to repent of every individual sin individually. Whew. That's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Um, forgive me, Rawl and other people of dear Dutch descent here, but I, uh, I greatly appreciated the uh, early discipline that I learned 
in the household of the Van Rijs down in Christchurch, good Dutch people, who taught us to close the table with prayer. And there was, however, quite a distinct formula about that prayer, uh, which is apparent and so on. I know about easy it is to, to just get to... But one of them was, uh, I forget just the formula, but and for the forgiveness of all our sins, you know, and just... And the general broad sweep of the forgiveness of all our sins. Okay, now, I don't think it's wrong to pray generally and inclusively, but what this is saying is that... Uh, in dealing with God and with the particular sins that uh, plague us and separate us from God and create the burdens upon our souls, it's often necessary to just give more and forgive us all our sins. There are particular sins that need to be repented of particularly. Now, that's an area I'd love to do a bit more study of in the scriptures, but I think even in Psalm 32, we're given at least a hint of that, where uh, the psalmist says this, and it's probably again in connection with uh, the sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. Verse 2, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord doesn't count against him, and in his spirit is no deceit. Verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Now, I think that what David's talking about there was certainly a period where maybe he didn't see any guilt, but... God dealt with him anyway and forced him ultimately to own up to this cause of sin in his life. And I think many of us have experienced this kind of thing. We know very well there's been a particular thing that has created angst in our spirits and resulted in the grieving of the Holy Spirit. And until we deal with that sin that we are conscious of, we're not going to get peace. And no amount of general, Lord, forgive us all our sins, will restore the joy of our salvation. There are, at many times, particular sins that need to be repented of particularly. Now, men like B.B. Warfield and others have made comment to say that there are many, many sins we are not conscious of, probably the secret sins of Psalm 19, verse 10. Show me my secret sins. There are probably, well, there are many, many things that just slip by us. Miriam, at times, for example, is thinking, oh, those children of mine. And uh, she's probably thinking bad thoughts. And yet doesn't even think about this just in the course of a day. But God knows. God marks those things. But many of those things we don't know. And I think that where there is a genuine, humble acknowledgement that we don't know what's going on most of the time, God's happy to uh, forgive and to cleanse us from so many of those sins when we genuinely, humbly say, Father, for all those things I don't even begin to know and understand, please pardon me. I am a weak, fragile, frail sinner. When that prayer is prayed genuinely and sincerely, God, I'm sure, is only too willing. But if Whiter knows that he's stolen from rule, and he knows it very, very well, but he's not facing up to it, and he's not uh, seeking to repair that, and he's not confessing it, and that kind of thing, no amount of Bible reading and witnessing and all the rest are going to give that man peace until he gets right with God over that particular sin. And as a rule, we don't make much progress spiritually in our spiritual walk and growth until we begin to deal with particular sins particularly. Do you have a problem of fulfilling engagements you make? Well, don't just week after week, day after day, give us off, oh, Lord, forgive me, I bombed it again. We've got to begin to look at particular sins and deal with them particularly before we make progress and experience the peace and grace of God. Last one.
If I heard a beep beep go, which says that time's up. Here's a little one that, uh, not a little one, substantial one, but we look at it quickly. Private and public repentance. As every man is bound to make private confession of his sins to God, praying for the pardon of these, upon which and the forsaking of them he will find mercy. That's the first part, the duty of private repentance. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you think every man is bound to confess, and every woman too, bound to confess our own private sins? Okay? Personal, private sins. Do you think you've got to tell everybody about them, Muffy? No, sir, you do not. Not even nosy Parker lecturers or teachers or college principals. You don't need to tell me all your sins by any means at all. Except the ones you commit against me. <laughs> then you have to go and tell me about those. Okay. As everybody is bound to make private confession, incidentally, confession is simply the language of repentance. If we truly are sorry for our sins and grieve over them, confession articulates and verbalizes those. That's the language of true sorrow. We confess, admit, and everybody needs to do that for their own sin. And as they do so and forsake their sins, they'll find mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. So, as we have that private duty, it adds this. So, he that scandalizes his brother or the church of Christ. You'll see a note I've got in the notes here that elaborates a bit on what scandalizing meant back then. Scandalizes his brother or the Church of Christ, ought to be willing by a private or public confession and sorrow for his sin to declare his repentance to those that are offended, who are thereupon to be reconciled to him and in love to receive him. Now this is basically saying, there are some sins that concern us privately, personally and privately, and we are to deal with those with God. If, however, some of our sins involve a brother and that brother or sister knows it and that brother or sister are hurt or scandalized in any way, they, they become uh, laughed at, mocked at, their name is hurt publicly, that kind of thing because of us. If I go around a uh, slandering role here, publicly in the church and telling people, Roel Voskazang said this to me the other night when I'm misinterpreting what he said and in fact damaging his character. So he's hurt. Or if I, as a representative of the church, commit some heinous sin of adultery or something like that, so this church is scandalized as well in the eyes of the world. Certainly when you get in a position of leadership, um, I mean, if I was to go and start stealing and robbing, or if I was to, uh, for example, in my position, start going to pokies and uh, all these things, and Sam dragged me out of the casino night after night, half drunk, you know, what's going to happen to the college? What's going to happen to the church? Now, if I scandalize the church, what this is saying is, such a person ought to be willing, either by a private or a public confession. If I've sinned against Roe, perhaps by a private confession it might need me to, sin, to, to go back and to confess and say, Roe, I'm sorry. But if that's become public and affected the whole community as well, I might need to be ready to make a public declaration of my sin against my brother and to declare repentance to those that are offended who are thereupon, here's the other side of it, not only does God pardon and forgive our sins, but when there's been this public involvement of others in this, the other party are thereupon to be reconciled upon that confession and declaration of repentance and in love to receive them back again. Okay, so there is a public act of repentance, that kind of thing. You know, sometimes we just want to hush everything up and keep everything under the carpet and under rugs when in reality it's not hushed up anyway. There is a place, there is a time 
for there being a public recognition of sin, fault, <clears throat> and acknowledgement of repentance. Not common, however, I think perhaps needs to be in the church. In 1, Peter, 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul actually says this, If any elder effectively sins, let him be rebuked publicly that others may fear. And we want to say, deal gently with him so he's not hurt too much. Paul says, no, there are things like this that have got to be dealt with publicly and justly that others might fear. Whatever people say about corporal punishment, I know I was scared stiff of getting the strap at school. Particularly in standard three class, where there was a four foot long strap and the teacher used to have this particular style. It was a bit like that <laughs> Frosby flip jump backwards and he would back down like that. Oh, he was terrified of that. And there is an element also in the life of the church where God says public offenses got to be dealt with properly in a public sphere. You say, oh, you shouldn't do that. 1 Timothy 5.18 says that others may fear. I'm not going to do that kind of thing. All right. Much more could be said. We better end there. Thank you for your patience. Let's bow in prayer and we'll finish. Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace of your Holy Spirit that does work deeply in our hearts to generate faith and repentance within us. Lord, enable that to be a daily, ongoing thing that we may love you more fully, be changed more and more into the image of your Son. For we pray it in his name. Amen. All right, people online, sorry if I've gone a little bit long. I hope you're not going to get stung by too big a bill.